Welcome to the online open course in conservation genomics for threatened species management. I'm going to be taking you through module 5.1, looking at the different genetic data types and their uses in threatened species conservation. My name is Kim Otterwell. I'm a research scientist in the Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attractions in Western Australia. So starting off, um, Threatened Species Initiative is supporting four main genetic data types, and these are commonly used in threatened species um, management. So we're looking at reference genomes, whole genome resequencing, reduced representation sequencing, and targeted SNP genotyping approaches. Choosing a sequence approach um, really depends on your research question, but it could be conceptualized as being a consideration between uh, assessing the balance between the level of genomic resolution that you need, a number of individuals you may need to sequence, and obviously this will be constrained um, by available budget. So if you're looking for answering questions uh, very much at the genome level, so understanding genes and gene functions, um, then you may be looking at um, undertaking a reference genome sequencing project for your species of interest or using a whole genome resequencing approach. If you're more interested in assaying genetic variation across individuals and populations and not so concerned about understanding underlying genes and gene function in these um, in these populations, then you're down at this end of the spectrum, <clears throat> looking at reduced representation sequencing approaches uh, or targeted SNP gene typing. These approaches are on the uh, more cost-effective end of the spectrum, so it can be applied across uh, large sequencing projects. So a reference genome is a representative, well-characterized version of the complete genetic sequence of a particular species. So it in, aims to encompass the entire genomic content of a species, including chromosome structure, um, genes and non-coding regions. But because of the expense and complexity in undertaking a reference genome sequencing um, project, it's always advisable to check um, genetic databases um, to see if there are any existing resources out there for your species of interest or a closely related species. Um, so you can check genome dat databases such as NCBI and Ensemble for these. Or if you're in Australia, coming in 2024, uh, the Australian Reference Genome Atlas should be going online. And this is uh, a platform that aggregates genomic data from um, each of these different databases and provides it in a, in a more easy, friendly to use, um, discoverable uh, platform. A reference genome can provide a lot of important information for conservation type approaches. So as mentioned, if you're interested in identifying some genes or mutations that may be associated with specific, specific traits um, or, some, or diseases, um, you may use a reference genome for this. Um, reference genomes compared between species allow us to understand some of those functional um, differences uh, between species that allow us to understand the basis of genomic adaptations and variations in life history traits. And a genome actually allows us to understand patterns of genome evolution across the, the tree of life, so getting into those deeper questions. In the Threatened Species Initiative, uh, we use long read sequencing, um, PacBio specifically uh, for sequencing reference genomes. PacBio is one of those third generation sequences, so it uses an approach, um, single molecule real time sequencing that provides highly accurate and highly contiguous DNA sequencing reads. In this um, sequencing method, circularized DNA is anchored uh, within pores in the sequencing cell, and the DNA sequence is read in real time as these fluorescently labeled nucleotides are added to the DNA um, strand during DNA synthesis. So for reference genome sequencing, uh, long reads are certainly preferred over short reads, which uh, are the previous um, generation sequencing approaches. Um, long reads are highly contiguous, so these large overlapping fragments allow us to assemble a genome um, much more easily and much more accurately and much more completely um, than with using these short read um, sequencing approaches. 
The uh, one consideration for PacBio is that very high quality DNA is required um, for this sequencing approach. Um, so care must be taken when obtaining and preparing DNA samples for PacBio sequencing, which you can find more information in the sequencing guide at AGRF. So not only um, do reference genomes provide um, useful information about threatened species in and of themselves, uh, but they are also uh, recognised as an enabling resource in conservation genetics. So um, establishing a reference genome for a species of interest actually provides a foundation that can assist us in improving the accuracy and utility of other sequencing methods that we might be applying in conservation genetics. Um, with sequencing costs declining exponentially and initiatives such as the Threatened Species Initiative providing a platform for actually undertaking um, reference genomes at an affordable, uh, in an affordable manner, manner, it's likely that we will have um, reference genomes for many more species uh, in the very near future. So this um, really improves the utility of other genetic sequencing approaches um, that we may use. So whole genome resequencing is another genetic data type, um, again, focused on um, obtaining genome information from multiple individuals. It's a sequencing approach um, where genetic data is generated for these different individuals and then aligned uh, to the reference genome, again, um, showing that um, worth of having a reference genome and enabling other genetic methods. Um, it's particularly focused on assaying um, genetic variation between individuals. So you may be looking at SNPs or indels or rearrangements of genes, and these may um, form the basis of interesting questions. In conservation, um, it is particularly a valuable method um, because it provides that high resolution of understanding uh, local adaptation amongst populations or um, species in understanding um, those genotype by environment associations, which may be important in making translocation decisions. Um, it's a high resolution method, again, that allows us to get a lot more detail about inbreeding in populations, so using runs and homozygosity. And it's also um, a good method for understanding for functional variation across individuals within populations. So this may um, be um, a way to understand disease susceptibility in threatened species, for example. It is also uh, a way to obtain information on genetic load uh, that can occur in threatened species as a result of small population, ongoing small population size. So whole genome resequencing approaches tend to use Illumina um, sequencing by synthesis um, techniques. So these are short read approaches and um, they are useful in that uh, they provide an extraordinary uh, amount of sequence, of sequence data at a very cost effective price. So in these sequencing approaches, um, DNA is fragmented uh, individual barcodes are added to those um, DNA fragments. These are pulled and sequenced and assembled against a reference genome to actually identify variation across individuals. Reduced representation sequencing is a similar um, cost-effective approach in obtaining genetic information across multiple individuals. Um, it's on the more cost-effective end of the spectrum because it relies on complexity reduction. So commonly, um, this reduction is a, a achieved through restriction enzyme digest. Um, it means uh, the digest process means that you're only going to be sequencing a subset of the genome. So it makes it a very cost-effective approach for screening uh, lots of individuals. And in here, in this approach, um, we're particularly interested in looking at single nucleotide polymorphism variation across individuals and using these as genetic markers to infer um, things about the population dynamics uh, of threatened species. So in conservation particularly, it's a very common approach to use reduced representation sequencing uh, when you don't have any prior genomic uh, knowledge of a species as a, a way to obtain some baseline information um, on population genetic structure of species. So this enables us to identify or delimit species or identify um, other management units such as ESUs or MUs. 
It's a way of assaying uh, individual genetic diversity uh, across um, populations and a way of understanding the um, genetic structure of a threatened species. It gives us a way to rapidly assay kinship relatedness and inbreeding estimates for a threatened species and also um, provides a good means to um, to understand landscape level dispersal patterns uh, in these species. So two of the most common approaches um, used in reduced represent representation sequencing are the uh, double digest red seek approach um, developed by Peterson uh, in several years ago now, and also uh, a commercial service, um, Dart Seek, which is run by the Diversity Arrays Technology uh, Group. Um, both of these rely on um, a double digest, double re restriction enzyme digest um, that um, recognizes specific uh, sequences in the genomes and cuts the genome into smaller fragments. Um, so this is a way to actually reduce the complexity of the genome. And it typically means that um, some of those fragments that are making it through to sequencing only represent about 5% of the genome, but this is quite often enough um, to give you that level of population genetic information that you need. Um, it's a very light um, sequencing approach, so it's possible to pull many individuals into a sequencing run, again, making it very cost effective. Assembling the genetic data is helpful to have a reference genome to achieve this, to increase the accuracy of those assembly methods. Um, but because uh, the fragments are actually from known genetic sequences, um, it is possible. It is possible to use a de novo assembly approach um, here as well. So the fourth type of genetic data that we're using in the Threatened Species Initiative is the targeted SNP genotyping approach. So this is. Um, a method where some existing genomic knowledge of a species is required and it actually gives us a format to actually uh, look for specific genetic variants, variants that may be of interest for particular uh, research questions and it's provided in a format that allows for high throughput screening across multiple individuals in populations. So it's um, mostly associated with um, assaying SNPs. Uh, so this uh, means that it's entirely customizable to your research question. So if you're interested in um, targeting SNPs with a particular disease, disease association, you may only um, sequence a subset of these, um, whereas uh, some approaches also allow um, uh, for sequencing a, a larger number of um, standardized markers for genetic diversity and uh, genetic um, structure type questions. So in, as a conservation application, it's a very um, a useful method in population monitoring. So in approaches where you're actually having to monitor a threatened species and are repeatedly surveying species, it's a way to document um, changes in genetic diversity and inbreeding, for example, over time. Um, SNP panels are useful for undertaking pedigree and parentage analysis. So in captive breeding programs, you can screen individuals rap rapidly using this approach. Um, it's great for disease screening if you know something about um, association uh, with different SNPs. It's useful um, for screening hybrids um, very easily. And one of the great advantages, advantages of the targeted SNP genotyping approach is of all the genetic approaches, it's the one that is most useful for non-invasive um, samples. So this is um, obviously very useful for wildlife uh, applications. So there are many different uh, approaches for targeted SNP genotyping, um, and these vary from um, just using a few markers and to thousands of markers. So this approach um, typically uh, probes or primers are designed from uh, DNA sequences of from known DNA sequences and designed to actually target specific SNPs along those DNA sequences. So qPCR um, is probably the most simple method of actually assaying SNPs um, very rapidly. 
Uh, there's um, other platforms that use mass spectrometry or microfluidics um, to assay a greater number of SNPs. So these are in the range of say 50 to 200 SNP panels um, under these sorts of methods. And then there are some more um, high level uh, approaches that are actually looking at um, assaying thousands of SNP markers across the genome. Um, but these can be quite expensive and at the moment uh, tend to be used more for agricultural species. So for conservation species, we're usually down this end of the spectrum. So that's been a quick uh, overview of the four main genetic data types that we use in the Threatened Species Initiative. If you're interested in finding out more, please check out um, many of the other modules in this uh, series and you'll get some more information on undertaking sample collection for these and other um, information on how to actually use these methods for threatened species uh, genetic analysis. And a big thank you <clears throat> to all those who have supported and continue to support the Threatened Species Initiative.